today I have the honour of speaking with Neve Brennan. And Neve is Professor of Management at the UCD College of Business and Founding Director at the UCD Centre for Corporate Governance. And today <clears throat> we will chat about COVID-19 profit warnings, delivering bad news in a time of crisis. Hi Neve, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, thanks Patricia. Um, hello everybody, welcome to this webinar. I look forward to our conversation today, Patricia. I do as well, Neve. So let's kick straight off. And first question for you, Neve, is where are you located right now and what's been keeping you sane as we are in lockdown again? I am currently in the Quinn School, in a room in the Quinn School, because I wouldn't be confident in doing an event like this from my broadband at home. But during COVID, I'm normally in my office otherwise known as the kitchen, which has a very toasty aga cooker in it. And I have a big kitchen table over which I can spread all my papers. Lucky you to have a nice aga to sit next to. That's great. So Neve, you are Professor of Management and Founding Director of the Centre of Corporate Governance. So could you please tell our audience about this and about your research there and what makes you so passionate about what you do? Um, well, my two areas of research are financial reporting and corporate governance, and these have kept me absolutely sane during COVID. I've been having a fantastic time. So um, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is thanks to my UCD colleague, Dr. Sean Power. And Sean collected an uninterrupted set of annual reports 29 annual reports over 35 years from 1889 to 1924 of the British South Africa Company. And the British South Africa Company was Cecil Rhodes Company, which he founded to colonize Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. And um, the company was incorporated by means of a royal charter. And the royal charter required the company to engage in what we would call nowadays corporate social responsibility. So in Sean and my first paper, we analyzed the annual reports in terms of to what extent were they dealing with the corporate social responsibility requirements of the, of the Royal Charter reporting to the Crown versus the more typical um, disclosures to investors. In the second paper, we examine how the annual reports and the company portrayed the native people. And what we found was that um, the annual reports counted and counted and counted everything to do with the natives. And we conclude that annual reports were used as a tool of dehumanization of the native peoples. And we're currently, Sean and I are currently working on two more papers out of his incredible data set. That is incredibly intriguing, Neve, and I am sure we will have lots of questions about that in our 10-minute uh, Q&A. So please, if you do and you're listening, please submit your questions uh, via the chat function. So, Neve, you, you talked about corporate governance and, and that's your real area of research, but maybe you could tell us some flagrant uh, um, examples of abuse of corporate governance. Um, well, Patricia, tomorrow I am starting my first lecture this trimester with my MBA corporate governance students. Brilliant. And because of COVID, um, I have abandoned the normal end of semester exam and replaced it with a 5,000 word report uh, on a, the anatomy of a corporate governance failure of a student's choice. There are lots of them out there. So let me just um, discuss three. Um, for us in Ireland, I think the biggest recent corporate governance failure has been the Football Association of Ireland, leaving the organisation on its knees, following poor governance, arising from the chief executive having captured the board. Another one uh, that I've discussed a lot in my classes has been a German um, card payment business called Wirecard. And um, it, it collapsed 
and it had received clean audit reports for years. And it turns out that 1.9 billion euro in the balance sheet did not exist. The chief operating officer is still on the run. Nobody knows where he is. And then the third one that I'll share with you is a company, a UK company called Patisserie Valerie. And Patisserie Valerie is a chain of tea and cake shops. Like it couldn't be simpler from a um, financial reporting point of view. But it turns out that the company was um, exposed to a fraud, which is not, nobody stole any money, but six people um, engaged in fraudulent financial reporting, distorting the results of the company, because it was easier to commit a fraud than to tell, give bad news to the hard-nosed, results-driven executive chairman. That's absolutely incredible. And I am sure our audience will have lots of questions around that. And But just to finish today, I want you to, uh, I suppose we're going to go back to your title, which is delivering bad news in a time of crisis. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Please. Well, well I, got, I got, first of all, I, ha I got the idea of delivering bad news from the medical literature. There's a stream of literature about how doctors tell patients bad news. And um, a lot of my financial reporting research is from a communication perspective. And a financial report called a profit warning. And profit warnings disclose unexpected bad news to investors. And so I got interested in profit warnings from the perspective of how companies communicate bad news. And um, myself and Sean Power and Dr. Victoria Edgar from uh, Agar University in Norway, we have written a paper on three profit warnings of the now collapsed UK company Carillion. And we then decided that we would do another profit warning paper, but using a larger sample size than just three profit warnings. And along came COVID. So we collected and companies were disclosing a lot of bad news because of COVID. So we collected 568 trading updates from the London Stock Exchange, from which we extracted 164 profit warnings. And um, uh, the co we conclude that the disclosures in the profit warnings are very poor, the quality of them is very poor, and that companies regress to silence. In a time of extreme uncertainty, such as a COVID time, investors need good quality information. So it's quite damning that companies have been so poor in their disclosures. OK, OK, so let's move on. I, we have absolutely, thanks, Eve, we've absolutely tons of questions coming in. So um, I hope I get through to them all. If anybody has any burning questions, please do send them in and I will try my best to get through them. But here's some really interesting questions. Do you believe, so I suppose it's it's referring to your um, Rhodesia Zimbabwe example. And do so it's, do you believe measures are uh, measures are dehumanizing? And how do you believe data collection should be done to avoid dehumanization? Do, do I believe that measures? Yeah, measures, I suppose they're, I, I, I suppose they're asking around data measures. So I suppose I'll ask the second bit of the question. How do you believe data collection should be done in, in these circumstances to avoid dehumanization? Um, well, I, I, that isn't quite what our research is about. Okay. Um, you know, we didn't know the answer to the question, how did the British South Africa company portray the natives? Mm -hmm. until we looked at the annual reports. And interestingly, they didn't, uh, in the annual reports, call them savages and uh, other, uh, you know, inappropriate language. Uh, the, at the time, the Aborigines Protection Society was very active. So we reckon the company was very careful not to uh, use offensive language in relation to the natives. And one of the requirements under the Royal Charter was that they civilised the natives. So using uncivil terms to describe them would be inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't find in the annual reports what we were expecting. Um, and then when we thought about it, we thought that the way in which the directors of that company just uh, dealt with the natives was by quantifying them. And, and quantifying 
things dehumanizes it. Our friends in the medical profession know this very well. So if you hear medical people talking, they will not talk about thousands of people dying. They will take one case and they will use a single case to um, reveal the humanity of what's going on. And I think for all of us dealing with COVID, I certainly find myself that, you know, hearing about one case on the radio, or um, last week I was talking to somebody whose uncle died. He was taken away from the house in an ambulance and two days later he was dead. And that was the last his family saw of him. So single cases humanize, large quantities dehumanize. Yeah, it's, I, I, I agree. It's the stories behind the data that really do humanise them. Um, so lots of questions. So here's one. How, um, oh, I've just lost it. Um, how, how does corporate governance impact ordinary people's lives? Um, uh, most ordinary people aren't aware of corporate governance. In fact, um, uh, just again to take a single case, going back to the Football Association of Ireland, I doubt if very many football supporters uh, of the Irish team had any interest whatsoever into corporate governance, but they do now. So um, there was an organisation with a huge number of stakeholders, particularly football fans, And all of those football fans are now gutted that poor corporate governance has ruined the sport for them without money and resources. It's hard to see the Irish team being successful in future football competitions. That's very disappointing for football fans. So, um, you know, it it affects uh, day to day life of everybody in in. In, a very, in very broad ways. So if you take, for example, the banking crisis, that followed poor corporate governance. And, you know, all of us have had to pay for that. Yeah. And so it affects people much more than they probably realise. I think, and, and I think that's a, a good way to finish on that one. Uh, there's a lot of questions coming in on good corporate governance, but also I'm trying to tie about three, four questions together. There's good corporate governance, but the idea of... Um, the different parts of that governance in terms of the role of directors and the role of the executive and how do you you know if you're on say you would uh, and this is a question from somebody who's on a particular uh, uh, they're on the uh, role of the executive but how do you how do you keep an eye on this wavy line is the question they've asked. Mm. Um, Well, there are a whole load of what are called corporate governance mechanisms, checks and balances to ensure that corporate governance works properly. One of them is financial reporting, um, using a buzzword, bringing transparency to what's going on. But my own interest is, and I think it explains more or less everything, is that corporate governance at the end of the day is about human behaviour. So again, if you go back for the Football Association of Ireland, uh, John Delaney, the former chief executive, behaved in a certain way. He captured the board. They then became subservient to him. And that's why the corporate governance failed. It wasn't regulations. It wasn't, you know, it was down to the human behavior. And the reason I like the Patisserie Valerie case so much is because when I read in the Financial Times that little one line, one sentence observation that it was easier to defraud the company using fraudulent financial reporting than to fess up to the exact hard nosed, results driven executive chair. Now, by the way, he lost 220 million of his own personal wealth, he owned 35% of the company, but his behavior influenced his staff. They, he frightened them so much that they couldn't tell him the business was not doing well. It's incredible that corporate culture um, and almost in- integrity will have such a such devastating consequences. Uh, consequences. So, Eve, we're we're almost out of time, and I just want to finish on on just uh, I suppose uh, from our perspective in discovery, where we we I suppose are very passionate ourselves about interdisciplinarity, and we noticed that you have a degree in uh, microbiology. So, how has this influenced your career? Um, well, or your thinking. Um, 
<laughs> following following the heady days, and by the way, one of my classmates is on this call. I'm delighted uh, to see him. But anyway, following my heady days in science in UCD, um, I saw the light and <laughs> I, I joined what is now KPMG and qualified as a chartered accountant. So that's why I'm an academic in the business school. But in relation to my research, like to get published in, the, in, in really good journals, you have to have really good ideas. And um, I look to um, other disciplines to get my ideas. So I already mentioned uh, the medical literature on delivering bad news. I work with um, Professor Doris Merkel Davies from the University of Bangor. She is not an accountant. She is a linguist. So she has brilliant ideas from communication and linguistics, which we then bring into financial reporting. And then another paper that I co-authored with a Master of Accounting student, John Conroy, um, Lord David Owen, the former leader of the Liberal Party in the UK, he's a psychiatrist. And he took the 14 symptoms of hubris and he wrote a book applying those 14 symptoms to politicians. So we took that idea and we analyzed those 14 symptoms in the annual report of a bank. The title of the paper is Executive Hubris, the Case of a Bank CEO. And like Icarus, the bank CEO flew too close to the sun, his metaphorical wings melted, he fell, crashed to earth, but worse still, the bank crashed to earth as well. Well, what a way to finish. And I um, that is fascinating. And it just shows you it's really uh, at the boundaries of disciplines or when you merge thinking from different disciplines that real that incredible stories can uh, and incredible research can happen. So, Neve, unfortunately, we are completely out of time. Um, sincere apologies to those of you whose questions I did not get to. I just want to take this opportunity now to say an absolutely huge thank you to Neve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia, and thanks everybody for your attention. Yeah, thanks. An absolute fascinating discussion today, Neve, and thanks to you all for joining in. You can sign up to this series at zoomforthought.ie and where you can check out also our list of upcoming speakers for the rest of 2021. Thank you so much again, Neve, and thank you so much to everyone. Have a great day and see you all next week on Zoom for Thought. Thank you so much.